Uh, that description sound really technical and uh, fancy. Um, I'm the IT guy, or one of them. <laughs> As many of you mentioned, um, your concern is about this hot topic of cybersecurity. Now, what's interesting about cybersecurity is that <clears throat> it's really a, a new twist on an old spin, but nonetheless, it is a hot topic, a buzzword, as it were, in many of our industries. And so we're going to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, some practical tips to protect your company. So our discussion objectives for this morning, cybersecurity versus information security, what's really the difference? Uh, we're going to talk about some examples. No doubt you've heard in the news. Perhaps you've even gotten uh, a letter or an email from Target or Home Depot. Uh, what are the top 10 security pain points as described by Forbes? High-risk customer and employee data. How do we identify that? What does that really mean for our organizations? Uh, can we prevent security breaches? That's a good question. Hopefully during our discussion we'll, we'll answer that question for you. And uh, practical strategies to protect sensitive data is going to be really woven throughout our discussion. Uh, for discussions like this, we really like it to be interactive. And so uh, we'll sort of engage you as well as uh, uh, discussing these points, but we're going to also ask questions. So uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand, interject a thought or a comment, uh, because again, as most of you mentioned, um, cybersecurity is something that keeps you up at night. If and it doesn't keep you up at night, it's at least at uh, uh, one of the discussion points within your organization. And so again, we'd like to also hear from you on what some of your thoughts are with respect to cybersecurity. And so information security versus cybersecurity. What's interesting about that, and the reason why we say it's a, it's, a, it's a new twist on really an old subject, is because when we think about information security, uh, it really covers things like paper documents, digital and intellectual property, uh, verbal as well as visual communication, whereas cybersecurity focuses primarily on the electronic. Now, because uh, so much of what we do today is electronic, then quite naturally, this subject of cybersecurity is a hot topic. Um, usually for these discussions, you know, we, when we talk about security threats, um, uh, you could really scare individuals by talking about the threats that are out there and what the bad guys are trying to do. But one thing we notice is that uh, even though the threats are very real and very serious, it's not going to stop any of us from using technology. So. In our discussion, when we talk about cybersecurity, you'll notice in our discussion we're really going to focus a lot on awareness. Some examples. So we know that in the past we've heard of breaches. We know that uh, Sony was breached, Amazon was breached. Recently we've been hearing a lot about, uh, about Target and Home Depot. And what you see on the uh, screen here is statements released by both organizations. And the reason why we point these out is because by looking at the statements released and, and having a basic understanding of how these organizations were breached, 
uh, affords for us a healthy discussion and some things that we can kind of take away, points we learn from how they handled it. Uh, if you notice here, make sure my pointer is working. Okay, good. If you notice here, with, uh, with the target breach, they announced December 19th of 2013 that uh, they confirmed that they were aware of an unauthorized access to payment card, payment, uh, card data that may have impacted certain guests making credit and debit card purchases in the United States. They say that they were working closely with law enforcement and financial institutions and have, has identified and resolved the issue. Now, what's interesting is that in Target's statement, they use language such as our guest. That's clear that legal was involved with that, right? <laughs> and make sure that the language was correct. Or the language was soft. Um, and uh, it humanized their brand. When Home Depot released their statement on September 8th, they said they confirmed that uh, their payment data systems were breached, which could possibly impact customers who use payment cards uh, at their U.S. and Canadian stores in 2014. Now, the breach went from April to September. They also said that they were able to tell that malware, what, that malware was used uh, in the breach and that has been eliminated from the U.S. and Canadian networks. Now, as we look at the statements that were released here, what does it tell us about how they handled their, their data breach, in particular how they communicated that to their customers? Well, as we mentioned in the case of Target, it's obvious that legal was involved. And of course, with Home Depot, an organization like that, legal was also involved. But if we notice in the Home Depot scenario, okay, they used some additional language that was designed to give their customers uh, a little more assurance that the situation was handled. And as we move to the next slide, we point these things out. So as we mentioned in Target, they use language like guest, okay? Uh, our guest makes you feel warm and fuzzy. But notice here, approximately 40 million credit and debit card accounts may have been impacted between these dates, okay? In the case of Home Depot, we noticed that they, were, they notified the public in September, but it was a much longer span that the breach had existed. They used reassuring language like today we're able to tell you that the malware used in the recent breach has been eliminated. That's reassuring, right? One thing that Target did not do was identify um, that they had found the problem, here's what the problem was, here's how we fixed the problem. Now perhaps, perhaps what Target did was they looked at other organizations that had been breached before and tried to do a better job of notifying their, as they say, their guest. Whereas Home Depot, perhaps the length of time in which they had uh, announced to the public that there had been a breach, perhaps that length of time was also uh, used to find more information about how they had been breached. In either case, what we learn from this is that it doesn't matter the size of the organization, does it? Data breaches can occur at a very low level as well as at a very high level. So what are the top 10 cybersecurity pain points, which are really threats that can cripple a business? Well, first thing is APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. And we're going to talk about these in, in more detail. Uh, unpatched systems, such as desktop OSs and servers. Phishing attacks, both targeted as well as untargeted. Social engineering. Cyber extortion or ransomware. Mobile devices, attacks on the iOS and Android platforms. End user awareness, what you don't know, you don't know. Unpatched third party applications, which exploit things like Java, Adobe, and Flash. Endpoint and perimeter security. Who's at the gate? Poorly designed controls, risk, threat, and vulnerability assessments. Now again, these were items that were listed by Forbes. And for your individual organizations, uh, you may have a different set of pain points. But when it comes to cybersecurity, these were recognized as some of the things that were at the forefront of what people were concerned about. And so, a closer look at the top 10. Uh, APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. Yeah, just by a show of hand, are most familiar with that term? What Advanced Persistent Threats are? 
the IT folks in the room, raise their hand, right? Okay. So advanced persistent threats. Now these are threats that are unlike typical malware or computer viruses. Uh, advanced persistent threats are designed by nature to be undetectable by typical scanning tools such as <coughs> antivirus. They're stealthy, they're very difficult to remove. The best defense is hardening systems and end-user training to avoid suspicious content. It is Daner and Company. We use a methodology or a mindset referred to as stop, look, and think. The stop, look, and think method um, really employs the thought that when you receive an email, we encourage our users to stop, to look, and to think. And as we go further in our discussion, we'll explain how that, that works in our organization. What about the next item here, unpatched systems? Well, cyber criminals look for what they refer to as low-hanging fruit. An unpatched system such as uh, Windows 7 or 8 workstation is an open invitation for malware delivered from a compromised website or an infected embedded email attachment. The same is true of any internet-facing devices such as web servers, email servers, etc. The best defense, vulnerability testing and pen testing. This gives an organization visibility into uh, where the vulnerabilities are within their system. And perhaps many of you have seen, or perhaps uh, you've been annoyed by the Windows updates. They seem to come at the most uh, inopportune time, right? But the reason for that is because as vulnerabilities are, de are detected, then Microsoft makes an attempt to release a patch or an update. The recommendation is to always have that running. And if you have an IT, an internal IT department, uh, like Isner does, we, we vet out those patches or updates first uh, so as to make sure that they don't cause any further uh, problems uh, with the system. But again, the best defense is a vulnerability test and a pen test to know, to make sure that your systems are again up to date with respect to their patching. And again, any what we refer to as internet facing device such as web servers or email servers. Again, when, when cyber criminals look for vulnerabilities in a system, they scan the internet to see where there are servers that are unpatched or servers that are not up to date. Those servers then become um, infected through an exploit and typically what happens with a workstation such as uh, a Windows 7 or Windows 8 workstation that has not been patched up to date, it's, um, it's now become vulnerable to whatever that exploit is. And so again, to kind of seal the and circle the wagon, so to speak, with respects to unpatched systems, we recommend, again, that you make sure that your systems are patched. Phishing attacks targeted and untargeted. I want to trick you into giving me some information. Now, would most cyber criminals say that to you? Probably not, right? The methods that they use are a little more stealthy. It used to be pretty simple to, to detect um, if somebody was trying to dupe you. But today's cyber criminals are pretty savvy. The language that they use within their emails, you know, are well written. And so it becomes harder to detect that. Again, part of, um, part of the awareness training program that we employed here at ISDANER encourage our users, again, to stop, look, and think. We showed them several areas to look for in an email that's an indication that it's a, a phishing scam. The reason why we say targeted and untargeted. If um, most of you can probably relate to this, you've received an email and everyone in your organization received the same email. So it's an indication that, you know, someone was just, you know, they were sending out a mail blast and it was designed to basically see which email addresses were real. So for example, in a, a scenario like that, they may not know who M. Green at Isdane or LLC.com is. However, if there are graphics that are within the email and your, and your email client is designed or programmed to automatically download that graphic, well, that's an indication to the person that sent it out that that's a real email address. Once they know that, then they're able to do a targeted attack. Targeted attack or spear phishing is designed specifically for an individual. What's interesting about that is targeted attacks sort of go hand in hand with one of the other topics we'll talk about, which is social engineering. 
In this example, August of 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase customers fell victim to a targeted phishing scam. The attack included some new technical elements that tried to grab credentials to J.P. Morgan systems and install malware on those systems, which was designed to breach other institutions. Now, this was a basic attack delivery technique, and it has remained the same for many years. And so the question is, why are phishing attack methods that have been around for decades still effective? Well, the answer is simple, but a bit painful, perhaps. But the language comes directly from J.P. Morgan's website. And the answer is, is that because in the technology spectrum, we've been focusing, really, on technology rather than on people. When we do focus on people, we oftentimes do it the wrong way. What do we mean by that? Well, phishing and other spam-related attacks, uh, they don't really exploit technical vulnerabilities. What they do is they leverage technology and they exploit people. It's the human element that is exploited. Interesting, an issue such as um, phishing has really nothing to do with the digital age because deceptive actors impersonating legitimate parties, that's really, that's really a tactic that's been around for, for ages. And so when we think about cybersecurity, we think about phishing scams and things of that nature, again, they're really using old methods and old techniques to dupe people. So the best defense for that, we say it's security awareness training and organized phishing campaigns that are monitored. What do you think we mean when we say security awareness training? What comes to mind? What do you think? Security awareness training. <laughs> yes, good. Yes, stop looking think, right? <laughs> and simple. But what about the organized phishing campaigns? Have you, have you heard of that? For those who haven't, would you like to know what that is? Organized phishing campaigns? That, that's, where, that's where the good guys, us, we, um, we purposely set up phishing campaigns. It's not meant to dupe any of our users. What it's really meant to do is to give us a, a sense of how well our security awareness training is working, how effective it is. And so we will set up organized phishing campaigns and we will monitor that. That means that in our monitoring, we actually can tell who opened what, who clicked on what. And the landing page that they come to is like, oops, you've been duped, right? But there's no negative payload. What that allows us to do we don't go to Scott and say, Scott, here's a list of everybody that did the wrong thing. What that allows us to do is now we know where we need to focus our attention with respect to security awareness training. So again, a nice way to combat the, the exploits of phishing campaigns, targeted and untargeted, is to have a solid security awareness training <coughs> program in place that also allows you to do organized phishing. Another reason why this is important um, just by a show of hands, who has received emails from Target or Home Depot? Very, did you click on anything in the uh, email? <laughs> Very good. You guys would have got an A for our security awareness training. Because one of the things that um, cyber criminals do is that they use sensational headlines and stories as a means to create phishing campaigns because, you know, they know. So one of the phishing campaigns we did um, uh, when actor Robin Williams died, we set up a phishing campaign that basically said, you know, uh, see Robin Williams' last words kind of thing, because that's catchy. The idea is that this is the same thing, the same way cyber criminals think. And what we noticed in our training as well as our testing, when we started, we were at about 40% of users who clicked on emails like that. After doing the training and after doing the phishing campaigns, we noticed that number decreased to zero. What is that an indication of? That the training is working. That people are becoming more aware. That's the goal. Let's take another closer look at the top 10. Social engineering. Uh, this topic aligns most perfectly with targeted phishing. Uh, it's the idea of hacking people. Again, not new, but it's extremely, extremely effective method of stealing data and PII. PII is, is personal important information. In your organizations, you no doubt handle PII, personal important information. Um, there are some individuals here who are from banks, right, mortgage companies. Um, 
And so you're handling personal information. As an, as an accounting firm, we certainly handle personal information, important information. We have tax return information, social security numbers, things of that nature. And so, again, social engineering is a design to hack the individual, to extract information or get them to, to give over some information. Uh, an example of uh, so, some simple social engineering. Recently it was reported to me a, a situation involving an elderly woman who received the phone call in the middle of the night and the person on the phone said, Nana, you know, it's me. I'm in trouble. Please wire me some money. And the elderly lady thought nothing of it. She got up the next morning, she went to the bank, she took out $2,000, went to a Western Union and wired it to the number. And of course, it was not her grandchild. Now, when you hear scenarios like that, you think, well, you know, I would never do that. But long before the phone call happened, uh, this person was socially engineered, no doubt. Now, in looking at that story and examples like that, where does the social engineering take place? Well, oftentimes, it is personal information that's gathered through social media, such as Facebook. In this particular case, the person referred to her as Nana. So there was already a level of comfort. She thought the individual knew, after all, only my grandkids refer to me as Nana. So she thought it was her grandchild. Well, how did that individual get that information? Could have been on a social media site where the person had a picture of her grandmother, referred to her in the caption as Nana. The point is, is that the individual who called had some information about her that allowed them to carry out this exploit. Good references if you've never read these publications. Social Engineering, The Art of uh, Basically Hacking Humans um, by Chris Hagney. The other one is The Art of Deception by Kevin Mitnick. Again, if you, if you want some reading that's going to you know, uh, scare you, maybe perhaps make you not want to use computers, you know, you'll read those publications. It's very good, though. Very well written. Another uh, top ten is cyber extortion, also referred to sometimes as ransomware. Um, the model is we don't negotiate with terrorists. Have you heard of the crypto locker virus? Pretty nasty. The crypto locker virus is a Trojan designed to encrypt data or block access to systems. In a real world scenario, there was an organization that was hit with this, and some 200,000 of their files were encrypted. Each time you click on a file, it said, we've got your data. If you want it back, pay the ransom. You know, as an organization, do you, do you negotiate with terrorists? They've got 200,000 of your files encrypted. What's interesting about this is that, according to reports, within the United States, uh, some $30 million have been paid out in ransom fees to retrieve data. Now, what do you think the likelihood is that you pay the ransom and you actually get your data? What do you think? Absolutely no chance of it. Yeah, yeah. But companies were desperate enough to pay the ransom. What's the best defense against that? Corporate antivirus for endpoint defenses properly configured firewalls for perimeter defenses, close those ports. Train your users to contact support immediately. If something looks strange or out of the ordinary, uh, good corrective controls such as backups. Why do you think good corrective controls is an important defense to have? Because in the case of ransomware, where your files are encrypted, sometimes that is your only recourse, is to be able to restore what was lost. So. Having a good solid backup should be part of your, your defense for that. Mobile devices, attack on iOS and Android. Uh, do you remember a time when it was pretty safe that Apple devices would not be hacked? Do you remember that time? <laughs> That's changed though, right? Um, the bad guys are going after Apple OS's also. And of course, Android's Although you may favor Androids over Apple OS, iOS, uh, Android devices, because just of the nature of their platform, are also very much targeted devices for hackers. Um, it's really 
it's really consumerization that is sort of driving the push for the use of mobile devices. As mentioned in our slide, um, it offers huge benefits to business, it but at the same time, it increases risk. With respects to mobile devices, and the IT folks in the room will probably agree with this, uh, mobile devices hit the, uh, the business world so fast, uh, we had a hard time trying to catch up to protect these devices. The reality is, is that these devices are both used for business as well as for personal. And so just by nature of that, the risk for using them increases. Again, what's the best defense for that? BYOD policy, MDM solutions. Now, while BYOD policy is really just, you know, do's and don'ts, recommendations, best practices sort of thing, that sort of thing. Excuse me. Sure, sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Bring your own device. Oh. Yes. Uh, bring your own device. And even though it is a, um, you know, again, it's, you know, it's, your, it's an organization's document on what, what you can and what you can't do, what you should and what you shouldn't do. If you are using mobile devices in your environment, you should have a solid BYOD policy. An MDM solution, on the other hand, is a mobile device management solution, is almost a must for mobile devices within your organization. And when we think of MDM solutions, we're really talking about more than just the ability to wipe your device. When we talk about an MDM solution, we're talking about the ability to containerize the company data that is on that device. Some of the interesting solutions in place for MDM solutions um, allow basically uh, dual logins to a mobile device. Um, what's the likelihood on your mobile device that, you know, that your, your kid may want to play Angry Birds or some other game. The point that we're making there is that mobile devices are personal devices as well. And so people will use them for their personal means. Uh, sometimes an organization through, an M, through a BYOD policy will specify that if there is intellectual property, corporate data, client data on that device, then that device can't be used for anything else but business. Some organizations don't. It depends on how, how your policy is structured or worded. But regardless of how your policy is structured or worded, a best defense is an MDM solution to be in place. Again, so that the information on there is containerized and can be managed through a central source. Also, keep up with uh, tested and approved mobile patch updates. For our IT folks, why, why is that important? Approved and tested patch updates. Did anyone do um, the latest Apple OS update? Were you completely satisfied with it? <laughs> no. So <clears throat> the idea is to keep your information safe by making sure the patch is in place, but we don't want to break our devices either. And so when we talk about tested and approved mobile devices, uh, tested and approved mobile patch updates, um, if you have internal IT, then let them test it and let them clear it, make sure that the patch is okay, and that uh, you know they can provide some assurance that the patch will work for you. Or, yes, please. Uh, what about Windows OS phones? Mm -hmm. Windows phones, they're kind of bragging that their security is really tight. I mean, it's Microsoft, right? <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. Um, anyone that boasts that their security is 100%, yeah, it's impossible. And the reason for it is because, you know, we're, we're really talking about, with respect to cybersecurity, a moving target. It changes all the time. Some organizations do it better than others. Um, and like I said, you know, at one time, Apple enjoyed the, the luxury of not being targeted as much as Windows or some of the other OSs that are out there. But the reality is, is that um, at some point or another, they, they, they all have vulnerabilities. They all have exploits that uh, can be attacked. Um, so... You know, the thing is, is user beware, user be cautious, you know, and try to keep up with the, the trends in the news on the devices and their patches and security problems. Uh, end user awareness. Again, this is where training the end user comes into place. Uh, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. A quote taken from Sun Tzu. That's directly out of the book of cyber, of um, social engineering, hacking humans. So 
again, we think about end-user awareness. Uh, end-user awareness is more than just a simple list of do's and don'ts. It's, uh, it's not about, uh, you know, what is the punishment for clicking on or doing something that you shouldn't. End-user awareness training programs also incorporate the idea of rewards for doing the right thing. Um, best defense, formalized mandatory awareness training. It should be really uh, an organization's policy to have security awareness training in place, not optional. So for Isdainer and Company, again, uh, part of our security awareness training was first to uh, do a phishing campaign to see, you know, just what people knew, uh, what, uh, what awareness they already had in place to give us a benchmark for how, how to structure our training. Then once we did a heads-up session on training throughout the whole organization, we also followed that up with video training as well, along with continued phishing campaigns. So, again, formalized mandatory awareness training should be a good model to follow. Uh, test the effectiveness of the training. Again, test the effectiveness of the training, again, by, uh, by monitoring what users are clicking on through your phishing campaign. We're able, to, we're able to pull up charts. And again, this is not to embarrass anyone. It's not to, uh, to uh, put anyone off. But again, we want to know exactly how effective our program is. And so test the effectiveness. Provide awareness tips for at-home use as well as in the office. Why, why do you think that's an important aspect of security awareness training? Tips for at-home use. OK. Inevitable. Good. Anything else? At home use. Yes, please. Uh, practice makes perfect. So if you practice it at home, you practice it at work. Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. And isn't it also true that if a person has uh, unsafe computer habits at home, that they're probably going to be that way in the office as well? You think that's true? Somewhat? We found that that's the case. And here's how we test it. Um, a person says, you know, my computer at home is really slow. I mean, I click on something, I go, I go to lunch, I come back, and it's still trying to pull up the page. That's a pretty good indication that you've got some bad stuff going on on the system. Why? Because you probably clicked on everything, didn't practice safe computing, and your system, you know, is, uh, is impacted by that. It's pretty likely, even though there are perimeter defenses and endpoint defenses in place, that a person's habits are going to be the same. So again, yes, practice makes perfect, and it is inevitable, right? One thing I found very interesting with respect to, um, uh, to young children um, who are, of course, that generation is raised up in technology. They use it at schools. But what's interesting is that the, the, the learning institutions do not teach safety. They don't teach security. And so a young person's uh, login and password might be their last name and their room number, you know. Whereas when we talk about security, passwords, and things of that nature in an office, you know, we can be, we can be very technical when we talk about that. We can talk about passwords that are, you know, yay long or based on a phrase. So the idea is that when we talk about passwords and security uh, in the office, as part of a best defense, we want to also provide awareness tips for what a user can do to be safe at home so they can bring those same practices into the office. This uh, third idea of unpatched third-party applications. Now, we talked about unpatched OSs. The third-party applications such as Java, Flash, Adobe um, are equally important to OS patching, if not more important, because those are the applications, those third-party applications that are oftentimes overlooked. We sometimes will see a pop-up saying there's an update for Adobe. And what do most of us do? Not later. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Yeah, I'll get to it later on. So oftentimes, you know, we'll find that um, a third-party application such as one of those applications might be several versions behind. The thing is, is that it's been, you know, a tech note saying that there are known vul vulnerabilities with that uh, application. And so when we think about third-party applications, the best defense is centrally managed patching utilities. Those centrally managed patching utilities take the guesswork and the work away from the end user 
and basically allows the organization to manage patches. That way you can ensure that patch levels are consistent throughout the organization. When I think of patching um, third-party applications on computers, I think of the expression of herd immunity. Familiar with herd immunity? And why it's such a big deal now? Because some parents are opting, whether you believe it should be or not, to not have your child immunized. Well, it lowers the herd immunity. In the case of a network with technology, uh, one system can potentially compromise your entire network. Um, by a show of hands, how many people still have Windows XP still running? Okay. Okay. Um, how many people have Windows XP running that are part of a critical process? That's fair. Okay. Right, because Mike, go ahead, define critical. <laughs> like if it's, in, if it's impacted or infected, it'll shut your whole network down? No? Okay, good. All right. Um, the reason why, we, add, reason why we, we bring this out is because, of course, Microsoft ended support for XP. And pretty soon they're going to end support for Windows 2003 server. And so, you know, again, there, there's some pain, of course, in moving from, from one OS to another. But the reality is, is that a system that is no longer supported, no longer updated, becomes a risk to your entire, to your entire network. And so uh, we want to make sure that um, we, we manage centrally patching. We don't leave it up to the end user to update. Yes? How do you... How are companies handling uh, solutions that require out-of-date third-party software? So, for example, a T&E system that requires Java version 6. Mm -hmm. um, if your patching utility is scalable enough to make exceptions... I and mean, that's what we're doing. We're yeah. making an exception for those couple of, for people with access to that system. So, right. I mean, it's, it's getting worse every year. So, 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 yes, and, that's, and, and that's, a, that's a real world scenario in an organization where you've got a tool that works great. It just works great in, a, in an older, unsupported system on a third party software utility that is, again, out of date. And so, what we typically would recommend in that scenario is you want to insulate that system as best you can. Um, in some cases, especially where you have applications that won't install in 7, then we'll do a VM and we'll put security around the, the VM. And that helps us to kind of, again, uh, better insulate that, uh, that uh, OS, that machine. Uh, you know, again, that's a very real concern. And the unfortunate thing is that some of the vendors have not caught up, you know, to where the, where the rest of us are, especially in, when we talk about cybersecurity. You know, it's a problem, you know. But, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. For those of us whose IT is outsourced to a third-party supporter, um, who provides our antivirus, who does our backup, our storage, all of that, is it standard that they should be updating, doing the centrally managed patching utilities for us? Is that something we should be specifically asking for? I, I would. Yeah. And if the answer is no, that we don't do that, is that something they should be doing? Obviously, they should be doing it. Mm -hmm. But um, does that mean it's not really a, a top-tier servicer or, or service provider? Well, if, if you have outsourced IT support, and essentially they are, they are, managing, they are managing your gateway, they're managing the, the systems on your network, all of that, then that should be part of the service level agreement that they are offering, patching your systems. Again, <clears throat> you know, they could provide great tech support, but if you have systems that are vulnerable, you know? Yes, yeah, so my question is, if they say, oh, we don't do that, that's a separate item, does that make me concerned? It would make me concerned. About the other services they're providing? It would. Okay, it would make you. me concerned, sure. Because we talk about, we talk about patching in terms of a best defense, um, and I should have mentioned this earlier. When we talk about all of this in terms of security, there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing uh, that's going to inoculate and make you uh, safe from all of that. So when we talk about security and defense, we talk about it in layers of depth. So that's part of, again, a, a suite of, of tools, utilities, techniques that are designed to layer or insulate 
your organization. So yeah, I would have that discussion with them, find out, you know, maybe they are doing it. Right, you know? but I'm not saying they're not. Yeah, yeah. Let's put it this way, I mean, are, you, are your systems up and running good? Yeah, until they're not. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, you know, but yeah, have that discussion with them. You know, have that discussion with them. It's a good question. Any other questions? Endpoint and perimeter security. So, uh, are your virus patterns out of date? Has it been weeks since your last virus scan? Uh, are the firewall logs so large that I, I can't read them? I'll get back to them. Um, all ports are open and only closed if need be. Uh, does your perimeter security extend beyond your physical walls? What do we mean by that? Does your perimeter security extend beyond your physical walls? What do you think that means? When we talk about perimeter security, we're talking about things like firewalls. What's protecting, what's protecting the information coming in and out of your network, and in particular, the, the flow of traffic to and from uh, your servers as well as your PCs. So. That's the perimeter security, your wall, the gate, who's watching it. The question is, is that uh, does it extend beyond your physical walls? So here's a scenario. Um, your, your organization has 50% um, you know, are laptop users. So what happens when they go home? Now, behind the firewall, you know, they're protected. You know? They go to a website that's blocked, they'll get a pop-up. But what happens when they go home to a coffee shop or their network at home? and they connect. Does your perimeter security extend even there? So that, I'm good. Yeah, it should, right? Yeah, you should have it in a, um, you know, like you have something like Citrix and stuff like that so you can get into your servers and still have your firewall mm -hmm. up and stuff like that. So that's one way of doing it. But uh, let's say the person does not log into through a Citrix or through a terminal server session. Let's just say that they're surfing the web, you know? Should your perimeter security be in place as well? If it's your laptop, if it's the company's laptop, you should have some sort of virus protection on there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So endpoint security, absolutely, virus protection in place. But you know, I can't look at porn here in the office. But I'm gonna go home on my network and look at porn. Should that be? Well, we know that that shouldn't happen. But does your <laughs> does your perimeter security yeah, extend should, beyond that? Firewall should have those blocked off. Absolutely. And so what we're talking about for best defense, centrally managed AV, antivirus where patterns are updated, uh, check for updates throughout the day. Antivirus clients are updated in real time. Uh, antivi antivirus clients are quick scan once a day and deep scan once a week. That's just our scenario. You might find that you, you need to do it more than that. But that might be a good starting point. Uh, all ports are closed and only ports open that are approved. The reason why that's important is because uh, let's say you have a, uh, your firewall and you've got all ports closed off. You've only got ports open that allow people to get email, that allow folks to surf the web. You're fairly secure. Somebody says, I got this application. It needs to have this port open. Well, the recommendation really is to never do something like that on the fly. It should always run through your channel, whoever your IT support is your, or your outsourced solution, to make sure that that port is safe and approved. Just because a vendor says that this is the port we want to use does not necessarily mean you should open up those ports. For organizations that have all ports open and only close the ones that um, you know, they found to be a problem, uh, that's an issue. Because our tech folks, how many ports potentially are there? <laughs> a lot of ports, right? It's much easier to close the door and then only open up the door for the ports that you need. In terms of a best defense, that is, a, that is a good strategy to maintain. Um, Web-based endpoint manager to extend the reach of perimeter defenses. And so the tools that we're talking about are tools that will basically be installed on the client side, meaning the laptop, and they extend the policies that you put in place for uh, what type of web traffic, what web surfing and content is acceptable. So therefore, you know, some end users might think, well, you know, the way I'll get around the firewall is I'll connect, you know, to a, a Wi-Fi access point that does not have a firewall or a, a, an open DSL in place. But your, your firewall perimeter security that's managed centrally should also address that as well. Again, we recommend that as a best defense. 
poorly designed controls, risk assessment, threat assessment, vulnerability assessments. Um, so for controls, do you have a set of controls that address such areas as physical access, meaning key cards and uh, cameras? Uh, what about logical access controls, passwords, and multi-factor authentication? Um, reason why we say multi-factor authentication, uh, username and password is really no longer sufficient. You know, we, we've got to We've got to be smarter than the cyber criminals. And so when we talk about multi-factor authentication, we're talking about other layers of authentication that should allow us to gain access to our systems. Again, as a best practice, that's something we want to consider. Um, disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, why do you think that this falls under poorly designed controls? Disaster recovery. There's a statement, uh, an organization that, um, that fails to plan is actually planning to fail. So when we talk about disaster recovery, it's more than just your backups, but it is how do you, how do you put your organization back into place when, once there's been an event or an incident? We talk about disaster recovery. Um, disaster recovery policies or, or routines that have been written are actually live documents, meaning that they should be reviewed quarterly, annually, and they should be updated because your organization changes, your needs change, your storage requirements change. Um, any disaster recovery plan that's, that you have in place that, that does not include a mechanism for review, for testing, and for changing is probably something that you should revisit. Uh, because again, uh, one of the things that we learned, for example, with uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, organizations that were impacted by that, that had, you know, as part of their disaster recovery, they had tape or replication. Maybe they had redundant systems and off-site. Problem is, is that the redundant systems that they set up 10 years ago were grossly outdated and ineffective. And so again, we talk about disaster recovery um, in line with controls. That should be something that you visit often. Segregation of duties and access privileges tailored to job descriptions. Uh, sometimes we find that um, in an organization you may not have enough employees where you can do proper segregation of duties. But we also find that sometimes people have elevated privileges that don't need to have elevated privileges. And so a good review of who has access to what is really what's important. Uh, it, sh it should be part of uh, a best defense. Uh, risk assessment. Uh, what is my risk appetite? We know that many organizations in this respect fall short when it, when it comes to risk assessments. In other words, do they go through the exercise of analyzing what their risk is? How else would you know what your risk appetite is if you don't know what you can afford to lose? Now, some organizations say, we can't afford to lose anything. But is that true of a file server that's got, let's say, 20,000 duplications of the same file? You could probably get rid of the, the duplications you can probably manage that better. But risk assessments, again, should be part of your uh, plan when you look at uh, what things are at risk. Uh, threat assessments, what's the likelihood of an event or that an event will occur? Uh, when we always go back to the uh, example of 9-11. 9-11, uh, some companies had their, their, um, their off-site locations located in which building? the twin, the twin building. So when they both went down, the organization has lost everything. When you have um, events that cover a metropolitan area, it's no longer sufficient that your backup location be down the street or on the same grid. So we recommend that, again, when you're looking at, when you're looking at assessing a threat, you consider what's the likelihood that this event will actually take place and then you plan accordingly. Vulnerability assessments. Um, there are some nice tools that you can use. Nessus is one. Again, you have to have a good understanding of, of what you're looking at in order to make sense of the data. But the reason why we're saying vulnerability assessments are important is because through those scans, it will tell you which workstations within your environment are out of date, not patched, have software on there that shouldn't be on there. Again, it's a good tool to have as part of your arsenal of things that are going to help you to minimize risk. 
When we talk about threat assessments and vulnerability assessments, it really goes hand in hand with risk assessment because again, it helps you to understand what your risk appetite is. It helps you understand um, where you need to make adjustments and changes. So the best defense is if you don't have these mechanisms, you want to create this process. I've listed here some, some good references. NIST.org. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, NIST.org is a good reference. Again, uh, a lot of high-level technical jargon, but again, uh, on that website you'll find some pretty nice resources. Uh, ISACA.org is another one, and uh, OWASP Top 10 uh, applies mo mainly for individuals here who have web servers that are internet facing that uh, they want to look at what the top 10 threats are. High-risk customer data and employee data. When you think about this subject, uh, if you don't know exactly what you have, then how do you, how do you determine what should be considered high-risk customer data? Now, the reason why we ask that question is because of this subject here. We talk about data classification, which is understanding what needs to be protected by indexing relevant data. What we find in some organizations is maybe they have a naming convention in place for how they save data. Maybe it's just a container that they dump all of their data that they deem important to. But within that, they don't really know who created it. Um, they may not know if there's duplications of that somewhere else. They may not, um, they may not know who should have access to it. And so data, data classification is a process. It's an exercise. It's a lengthy, timely exercise. But it's an exercise nonetheless where an organization goes through and they try to understand what they have. When you do data classification, it also leads to other things. Data mapping, for example, understanding where the data resides, uh, understanding who should have access to it. Also, what is the retention for this data? When you think about retention, uh, why is that an important thought to keep in mind with respects to data mapping and data classification? Data retention. What are your thoughts? Yes. In your best interest to not keep the data longer than you need to. Mm -hmm. The more data you have, the more you have to protect. The bigger the risk when you, when you eventually do be a breach. Yes. Yes. And in the case of uh, lawsuits, litigation, what happens to data that you held on to that you didn't need to hold on to? Yeah, you have to, it's all discoverable, right? But the other nice thing about data mapping is also a mechanism for understanding, especially if you have mobile users who may, who may have files stored locally on their laptops, is understanding who's got it, where it's at. Because if a user, let's say, is given remote access, um, if they were to copy a file onto their, let's say, their home system, in a case of litigation and discovery, what happens to their home system? Yeah, it's discoverable also, right? It's amazing. Some, some, some organizations don't look at that. Now, of course, legal will tell them that. But it's important for us to understand where the data is, where it resides, who has it, and whether or not they really should have it um, for all the reasons that we just talked about. So that, again, is what is at risk. Any questions so far? What we talked about. Yes. The total technique of like I log in sort of these generations of iterations of this where it's the random numbers generated and it can be very bulky and difficult. And now we have this mobile iron and go to that and go over it. Is that how safe is that? How safe is my personal data? Is I'm on my iPad or on the home? And within seconds I'm in, and it's obviously I appreciate that this I can remember a year ago, you know, the random number number generator had been used a certain amount, it was just a very difficult bulk process. Sure. So on the one hand it's great, and the other hand you go, oh, wait a minute, what about my personal data? Who has access to my stuff through this? Right. So good question. In terms of how safe it is, um, the rule of thumb is that anything that is wildly popular at some point is going to be a target. Especially when people, what, what's, what's amazing is that um, uh, the cyber bad guys, 
they do security awareness training also. So, so they're kind of they're kind of learning what or they know what we're we're trying to achieve in terms of awareness. And so, when we talk about products and tools that are designed to uh, be both convenient and also secure, uh, the more popular that becomes, at some point, it becomes a target. So, you know, right now. It's probably fine. And as long as the organization that backs it continues to put the support into it, uh, continues to stay on top of it, um, then it's fine. We think of, uh, for example, there was a story, not, there was a story about uh, when AOL was breached. Now, uh, AOL was breached through a method of social engineering, and it was one of their tech guys that basically opened the door up. And the, 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 uh, the breach went this way. Tech guy was on the phone with... Uh, with a customer, an end user who was reporting the problem, and they got into a conversation, you know, sports, this, that, cars, and the guy said, oh, you like cars? You like sports cars? And the tech guy said, yeah, I love sports cars. He says, I'm selling one. I'm selling a sports car. Would you like to see it? He goes, yeah, sure. I'll send you a picture of it. He sent him a picture, and that picture, that file, contained a virus. You know, clicked on it, next thing you know, you know, AOL users, their accounts have been breached. The point that I'm making there is that um, even sometimes when there is um, safety measures put into place, when there is applications that are designed to be both convenient and robust in security, when it becomes wildly popular, somebody's going to target it. So um, what that means for all of us is, unfortunately, uh, since the target keeps moving, we have to keep moving. You know? That's a good question. No. Right. Any other questions? I want to show you a video if we if we've got just a few more minutes. Did anybody hear this guy, Kevin Mitnick? I mentioned him earlier. You know, um, Kevin Mitnick at one at one point was uh, he was like the number one security threat in the United States, and he went to jail and uh, he got out. They gave him a job as a consultant. Yeah. Go figure, right? <laughs> you ever received an email? Have you opened it? Is it safe? What if I can tell you a hacker could send you a booby trap PDF file, and once you open it, the hacker has complete control over your computer and can do anything? Now, presumably, your company. Whenever you receive an attachment in an email, whether it's an office doc or a PDF file, we actually scan it with some sort of antivirus software to make sure it's safe before they send it to your mailbox. So let me tell you the setup I have here. We have a Windows 7 laptop running the latest security patches. I installed McAfee antivirus and I just updated the virus definitions maybe 30 minutes ago. And over here we have the hacker computer. And if you look up the screen of the Hackman computer, it's blank. But what this is what we call a remote access trojan. So when a victim's computer becomes infected, we'll see a line pop up here. And this line lets us have full control of the computer, but it's an indicator that this computer is infected. And it doesn't matter that this computer is running antivirus software because the trojan simply bypasses it. So let me show you what we have here. We have a file here called no malware here, .pdf. I simply downloaded it rather than opening up an email just because it's faster. And would you trust it just because it says no malware here? Or should we exercise some due diligence and actually scan it? Well, let's scan it. So what we'll do is we'll right click it. We'll scan for threats. We'll clean it if it is a threat. And as we can see, McAfee antivirus didn't find anything wrong with the PDF. It's clean. So normally what somebody would do is simply double click the PDF and open it. And what's going to happen here, it's going to try to open up the PDF file, but it appears that it's frozen. It's not actually frozen, it's actually running the hacker's exploit to take control over your computer. And as you can see, it closed the PDF file, nothing opened. But what happened over here is on the hacker's computer, we see a line. And on this line it says, that a machine name called infected connected. So what this means now is this computer here is now infected with what we call a remote access trojan, and it gives the hacker lots of control over your computer. And let's take a look at what the hacker could actually do. 
So what we'll do over here is we'll click it, and we'll see that we have a whole bunch of functions here. The hacker can upload and download files. They can run the Windows shell and actually enter commands into your computer. What about your passwords? For example, if you have stored passwords in Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, in your VPN connectivity system, the hacker can get those passwords. Let me show you. It simply runs this tool. It uploads a little program. And now we see here that one of the VPN passwords is no before rocks. That easy. It actually has a built-in keylogger. So anything the victim types on their computer, whether it's to log on to their bank, their credit card company, or their work computer, the hacker can now get their usernames and passwords. Now what would be more scary is that the hacker can actually watch you through your camera. Simple. Let me show you how the hacker does that. They run this tool called Webcam Capture. They start it. And what it does is it secretly turns on your camera. So, it, so now the hacker, as you can see over here, could watch everything you do. Kind of creepy, huh? How did this happen? The victim opened up a PDF file that's been booby trapped by the hacker. The hacker was able to ensure that the antivirus software would detect it. And now the hacker has complete control over the victim's computer. So what do you need to do? You need to stop, you need to look, and you need to think about opening up any type of file, even a PDF file, unless you know, or rather personally know, the source, which means who sent it to you. So please, be careful out there. What do you think? Kind of, kind of scary, right? Um, terrifying? Perhaps. But just by seeing that, just by a show of hands, how many of us are going to stop using computers today? <laughs> Unlikely, right? So you can see why companies hired this guy to basically be a consultant. You know, just the knowledge. Because, again, if you're going to fight against cyber terrorism or cyber security threats, you kind of have to know where the threats are. Programs like this is really designed to elevate our awareness. And again, if we think about some takeaways, overall, we want to ensure the confidentiality, the integrity, and availability of our systems. And as we mentioned, there's no silver bullet for doing that. And so when we think about cybersecurity, remember, it's going to always be in depth or in layers to insulate ourselves from the threats. We asked a question earlier, can we, can we prevent ourselves from being breached? If somebody wants in your system bad enough, they're probably going to gain access. However, by having defense in depth, we can slow them down to the point where our other controls, hopefully they're designed in such a way where we can detect and we can prevent. So again, we think about our objectives, you know, with respect to security. Our, our information is important to us. It's important to the customers that we serve. In order to provide a, a high level of assurance, then we need to take the steps that are necessary to make sure that we protect the data. Thank you. That's all I have for you. Yes, question first. Two quick ones. Yes. Do you reduce your vulnerability by actually turning off your computer to not use in the evenings? It, de it depends. And the reason why I say that is because <clears throat> um, in our case, all of our patches and scanning happen at night. And so we encourage our users to log out of their systems, leave it on. That way our centrally managed uh, processes can basically reach out, can scan the, the, um, the workstation, can check the patch levels. Uh, any workstation that for whatever reason, if a patch fails, we get a report and we see. That way we can go directly to that workstation. So uh, in that respect, um, if you have a centrally managed process in place, then leaving the system on is, is actually a good thing. Um, if you don't, then I would do, just as you said, I'd probably turn my system off at night if there was no mechanism in place for making sure that the system was kept up to date, was scanned, things of that nature. Good question. Yes? On a global basis, we become so, our country, the world is so dependent on the internet right now mm -hmm. that we can't function without it. Yep. Is there any realistic possibility that the entire internet could ever be 
uh, wow that's um <clears throat> it, you know in the techie circles you know we debate about you know what you know man cyber terrorism you're going to turn the switch off what's interesting is that you know the internet is designed in such a way so that there's redundancy throughout now having said that with regards to the cyber threats that we've seen where information is stolen data is taken you know, companies offer a year of credit monitoring, things of that nature. If you were a bad guy, wouldn't you simply wait for the year to pass? You got the data. We really don't know what they're going to do with it. And so some are under the belief that that is going to lead, at some point, to an all-out attack on the financial system. With regards to technology, really, all the bad guys have to do is just crash a portion of it, like the financial system. Or let's say, you know, one one... Um, utilities company, and I don't know what possessed them to do this, but they had their, they had the controls for monitoring as well as um, uh, valve control. They had that accessible on the internet, and it and the system got hacked. the The hackers were just about ready to open up the valves to uh, contaminated water to let that in with fresh, clean water. But the question is, as a why would you ever put that on the internet? So there are a number of systems that are, that are internet-based that shouldn't be internet-based that becomes a, an attack target, you know, for a hacker to look at. So um, in one respect, there's redundancy built in, but in another respect, some of these new threats that we're seeing on the rise, where information is being taken and systems being compromised, it's kind of hard to say, you know. Nortel, you've heard of Nortel? think they've gone out of business, they liquidated their assets, that sort of thing. Well, Nortel was, was compromised for 10 years by the Chinese government or by an organization that was probably sponsored by the Chinese government. But for 10 years before they realized that they had been hacked. From the server level all the way down to the workstation level. The, the amazing thing is that when they, when they sold off their assets, they didn't tell anybody, they didn't disclose that their systems had been compromised. Now, Nortel made systems for the government and for other companies, you know. Who knows what, uh, you know, what, what had been compromised with respect to the, the, the hardware and the software that runs those systems. It's interesting. It's an interesting place to be in. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, password management. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember reading somewhere that, you know, there's a couple of them out there um, you know I definitely do the homework on them and I would also throw in some of my own personal methodologies like I use a password manager and one of the things that I do is my passwords are composed of, of uh, phrases where you strip off the you know the, the first letter uppercase lowercase and then I leave blank the last few letters because only I know what that means. So in the event that a password manager is ever compromised, breached, you know, they have a pretty hard time figuring out what the password is. So it's good, it's convenient, you know, but I would I would I would throw another layer of security in there as well. Oh question? yes, I had a question on updates that come to you. Mm -hmm. I I'm always a little skeptical to click on them similar to an email. Is mm -hmm. that you know is that the right way to behave? I, I want to I want to go to the actual site, the Adobe or whatever, and, and find the up, update as opposed to clicking on things that come to me. Right. Is that going to the actual site's good idea? Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly understand the the caution behind a pop up for an update. Right. You know that's why again we talk when we talk about a centrally managed tool. Right. You know um, because part of a centrally managed tool is also a vetting mm -hmm. of the updates that are going to get pushed out. That's why, um, you know, in a company, it's it's a good idea to take that burden off of the user, and and, and put it in a more managed location. So. But from personal use, you, you would you, you think that's a good for your system at home? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Go to Adobe, see what they're trying to give me. Absolutely, good question. Yes, please. Well, a lot of uh, employees who work offsite or remote work for many years, that kind of thing. Not in a centralized location or on our domain to deploy updates the way that you would over a domain server. Is there any kind of application or something that you recommend for that scenario?
scenario where we have to push these updates out to them, but they're you know, in Alaska. Sure, absolutely. Today's networks are ubiquitous, right? You can get to them from anywhere. So without endorsing any one particular product, I can tell you about a product that um, called GFI, which provides a cloud solution for doing just that, where, again, you, you load the client on that remote workstation. You can then manage and see it from a centrally uh, located uh, workstation or server. And, and it will, across the internet through, uh, through an encrypted tunnel, it will push updates and patches to those workstations. And it'll also tell you if it failed, um, if it was, uh, it doesn't even give the person the ability to, to decline it. It happens in the background as a service. Okay? Again, thank you, everyone, for your attention. Okay? Thanks, ladies sure. and gentlemen. Thank you so much. If you've not yet done so, would you please fill out an evaluation that helps us to uh, plan these programs and make sure that we're on point with everyone's expectations. Our next program is going to be um, on December 3rd, featuring Dave Rowan of Philadelphia Union. He's going to be speaking about um, management and empowering staff. Am I close? Uh, operating, motivating a team. Sounds like a great program, and Dave Rowan's a great guy. So um, if you're not in, not registered, um, you can reach it through our website or through... Jill Lock at uh, it is DanielLLC.com. Folks, we try to get you out by 10, and it's 10 0 10. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a great day.